I'm Catherine Burns, I'm a historian by profession and I work at WISER, a research institute based at WITS. This year is the 100th anniversary of the African National Congress, the ANC, the current ruling party of South Africa, in power since the 1994 Democratic Revolution and its elections. It is extraordinary in this year of transition that the ANC holds its 52nd policy conference at Gallagher Estate in June. To mark this key event and to offer detailed analysis, WISER, a research unit at Wits University, in conjunction with the Mail and Guardian, has gathered on May the 30th to dig down into the ANC policy documents. Good morning, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen and friends. Uh, my name is Belinda Bazzoli and I'm the acting director of WISER, this wonderful institute. And it's a great privilege to welcome all of you here this morning. Now, we have a great number of extremely eminent and important people here today and um, I'm going to welcome them all generically, I'm afraid. And I'm going to also say um, how wonderful it is that we have this partnership with the Mail and Guardian. Um, where we can arrange a joint event of this significance and import. Now, in order to open the event, I'd like to invite our Dean, Professor Tawana Kupe, who many of you will know either as your colleague and Dean or as a commentator on uh, TV and in, uh, in the papers uh, and uh, an extremely eminent uh, media personality or media specialist, let's rather put it that way. So may I welcome our Dean. Um, to welcome you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks, Professor Pozzoli, for, for this opportunity to open this conference. First, I would like to apologize to our partners, the mailing guidance, because I'm going to be quoting from not the mailing guidance, but the uh, <laughs> Financial <laughs> Times weekend. <laughs> what I'm going to read was in, as you know, the Financial Times weekend has this uh, popular section where they take someone to lunch. They've been doing it for 30 years now or it was the 30th anniversary a few weeks ago. So last week they took uh, Paul Krugman, the Nobel uh, uh, Prize winner 2008, uh, a US professor, who is prolific for a number of things, and why I'll quote from there has relevance to what we're doing today. But first let me say one or two things about what we're doing today. I I'm pretty proud that we're doing this today, discussing the ANC policy papers. The NC releases these papers and says and invites people to discuss these papers, mm -hmm. to critique them and to comment. I don't know how many people actually take up the invitation. I'm still interested to find out, for example, and, and the Mail and Garden, among other papers, uh, I've written a column saying so myself, is that I don't think they ever go to the branches to find out whether really when these papers have been released, there's actual robust discussion of the policy papers. Because what we see in the papers is who's likely going to be president or not, and who's out and who's in. I myself hosted an event innocently three weeks ago, uh, together with the Ahmed Katharada Foundation in the Great Hall at Fitz. They invited me to co-host it and to, to open it. I had a little suspicion that it might turn out to be some element of the road to Mangawung, as they call it. So there we, we get there, and the speakers, the the, the occasion was a memorial lecture to Walter Sisulu, who was, who gave 1,000 on that particular Friday, and when ANC also 1,000. Key speaker, Cyril Ramaphosa. Although as the program developed in the hours leading up to the event, more speakers emerged, but the key speaker was Cyril. Amin Katrada spoke as well, who was the chairperson of the event, uh, together with me, Derek Hanekom, famous for the disciplinary committee. And there were allusions to this. So he was the chairman of the disciplinary committee, the appeals chairman, together at a function. Everything went very well until after Cyril spoke. Derek suddenly says, You know, 
I wish that Cyril could uh, stop his obsession with these uh, animals with horns like this. Remember, Cyril was bidding for a buffalo worth 20 million rand a few weeks ago. And occupy a senior office in the Republic. Uh, there was some kind of clapping. And then <laughs> the following Sunday, City Press covered the event, but as Cyril trying to kite fly his, uh, <laughs> his, uh, his uh, attempt to be president. So why am I saying this is that what I would like to see in our papers, and this of course is not happening on the ground, is a reflection of what kind of debates are happening around the ANC policy papers. Because I think the ANC is unique in our country, in our continent, as a party that releases these documents for public com comment, and there's an elaborate and extensive process for apparently discussing these policies and finally adopting them at a Congress at the end of the year. But also, this is a fa why I'm happy today and to be here today is this is a first for this institution. I mean, by this institution, I don't mean VITS. I mean WISER. In, uh, and WISER has gone through a series of changes. Uh, Professor Bozoli is the acting director. There are new people, and there are also people that used to be here. But I think that in the past, WISER didn't, didn't specialize in policy critiques of this kind. And to some extent, it was a choice that no, they were not really interested in, in, in these kinds of policy debates. But I think that it is important to do so. And therefore, that we do in this today, I think that marks an important mark in 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 in, uh, in wiser, in what wiser does, and in what we do in the faculty and in the university. Because whether one likes it or not, policy matters, whatever you consider policy to be, and also you ignore an an an, an organisation like the ANC at your own peril, as some might have discovered this uh, uh, this very uh, last 96 to 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 more hours. So so. The NC might be anything, but it, in a sense, has this machinery which it can mobilize and it can perform. And also what, I, what we're interested in today, of course, is policy performance. I've always said also is that what's the, what's the best way of academics contributing to policy debates or indeed even to policy? I think a university is not a party organization. And I think that a, the best way university can contribute to policy making and policy debates is that from critical analysis, image policy options and not the other way around, where people actually without much thinking, without much analysis, without much critique, draft some policies which look, in fact, look disastrous and can, can turn out disastrous. What academics do, especially academics who have a critical analytical approach, will look at an issue critically analyze it, and from that critical analysis, uh, which is not instrumentalist, will emerge policy options that can that then get into the public domain. I think that is where the media comes in. And so I think this partnership is also interesting in that regard is for doing policy critique today. What kind of options might come out of that which are not necessarily explicit? Some might be explicit. And how will the media cover that? And that is where uh, my last comment uh, uh, Professor Bozoli, because you're saying there, he goes on again. This is going to be my last comment with my quoting from the Bible according to the FT weekend. Now, Paul Krugman is a very interesting academic in that regard because he's a professor of economics at Princeton. I want to read some stuff here which shows how he occupies both the academic world as well as media space in pursuit of robust contributions to policy analysis and to how a society should develop. This is what he's, he, uh, he says, uh, uh, being, uh, being asked by the interviewer. I asked him about his punchy and provocative style. How conscious is it? I had already done some of it in Slate. Some of you will know Slate online. So I'd learned some of it. But this writing for the New York Times is even tighter. There's a craftsmanship of making it work so that somebody whose ordinary instinct is to think, oh, economics, boring, will actually read through your piece. I think that is, a, a, that is a challenge to both the academics as well as to the media. How, because policy is not something that is exciting. It's not something you are going to wake up and take a newspaper and read. Our newspapers are full of other salacious things. Uh, you know, Kenneth, Kenneth Kunene, Bali, and others, and people who tweet foolishly, I think consume quite a lot of our time. So how do you make policy debates actually sexy enough for people to actually read them? He says... What fascinates me, I say, is the interviewer, is how he manages the output, particularly the quantity of blogging he's doing. Obviously, Krugman is quicker than most people, but, that, but how does he get time for anything else? I'm still teaching. I probably work 70 hours a week, but not 100 hours a week. 
But I'm damned fast. I write faster than just about anybody in journalism, underlying in journalism. It turns out, which is interesting, Krugman is famous for resisting structural explanations for the high levels of unemployment. But what does he think of, of the view that our economies are dangerously addicted to financial and asset price bubbles? He replies by asking whether I've ever seen the satirical publication The Onion. Quite early on, they had the perfect headline, which was, Recession Ravaged Nation Demands New Bubble to Invest in. I'm a bit slightly irrelevant, but the point I'm trying to draw there is that, that if the ANC, whether one likes it or not, has an incredible energy. I mean, if you look at, I have read all of the policy documents. If you look at their output, whatever you think of his qualities, that somebody actually sits down, makes sure these things are written, they are released to the public, organizes a conference to review them, and also seeks to have them adopted. That kind of energy is not usual. And also the, the, the energy that Krugman also exhibits here is also unusual. He teaches Nobel Prize winner, he blogs, he writes columns of the New York Times every week and others online. I think that if we're going to be serious about where our country and our society is going, we will all need to match the, 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 in, the, in the policy space the kinds of energies that are exhibited here because they are also intellectual. There are also energies that are associated with actually both being intellectually and spiritually inclined to the pursuit of democracy. Thank you very much, Professor Kupo. Here are opening comments by Professor Belinda Bazzoli. She is the acting director of WISER, a leading sociologist in South Africa and advisor to the vice chancellor of Wits University. Now, I just want to um, mention for those of you who weren't here last week, that we did have a curtain raiser occasion where uh, Mr. Mwaletsi Mbeki spoke on what has the ANC achieved in the last 18 years. The government has taken thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres from the Africana farmer. They're lying fallow. Now, as you can imagine, it was a pretty so, raucous occasion um, at which he made some extremely telling points. And I just wanted to put those onto the agenda so that we don't so that in a way the effort that he made in thinking about this matter doesn't go to waste and that our considerations today about what the ANC's idea of its second transition is uh, are, are set in that context. It's very difficult to sum up his whole speech um, and it is available online um, as a podcast should you wish to get it, I think on the m and website and on WISER's website. But I think the essential point that he was getting at was that a major shift has occurred in the economic system being overseen by the ANC during the 18 years of its rule. Um, and that this shift consists of the following, that we, we are seeing a decline of the productive base of the economy, or at least a static, uh, a static situation in the productive base of the economy, and a rise in the economy consumptionist um, features. So the ANC has overseen the economy moving from an economy that had a very robust and um, slowly emerging um, industrializing base. Admittedly, he, he, he doesn't suggest that in any way we were going to move towards a full industrial economy without the dependence on uh, raw materials but he did suggest that we were beginning to industrialize to an economy where the industrial base is declining, dependence on raw materials is increasing, that dependence depends on China's economy, while at the same time, the levels of consumption have grown exponentially. And he had some extraordinary graphs which indicated the levels of consumption <coughs> growth. Um, and he, I think was suggesting that this major change in the economy is going to make some of the rather romantic uh, hopes that appear in these policy documents impossible ever to achieve because the productive base is not there. Um, so he was making a really fundamental point and I, I think it, it's important that it be borne in mind um, during these discussions. Okay, so we're now moving to session one which is, um, we're extremely honoured to have our two great speakers here, Nick Dawes, 
who is the uh, editor of the Mail and Guardian, um, who is well known to all of you, and Ashil Mbembe, who is a professor in Wiser, um, one of the most respected professors in the country, with a um, frighteningly um, huge international reputation as well. He thinks I'm teasing him when I say that, but I'm not. He really does have that. And um, the two of them are going to address this, this, this issue of the second transition, as envisaged, in, I think, a general sense, before we come down to the specifics in each area, law, um, economics, etc. Here is a presentation by Nick Dawes. I, I spent yesterday afternoon uh, rereading the main strategy and tactics document on the second transition. Um, which sets out to frame uh, the process that the party expects to unfold now uh, against the backdrop of the march on the Goodman Gallery, um, which was a deeply disjunctive sort of experience in many, many ways. Um, the document itself, I think, despite being encrusted with quite a lot of Moscow party school uh, language, is in many ways a pretty sensible sketch of the failures and successes of the last 18 years. Um, you know, it sets the economic policies of the ANC, uh, the plans around uh, social transformation and demographic transformation in a pretty reasonable framework of globalization, um, of changes in the labor force here, um, and so on. And it's probably pretty sensible because it's mainly a product of the National Planning Commission, which is a sort of semi-detached wing of the presidency where the smartest policy people who are aligned to the ANC uh, sit and, and fabulate about what a rational course to 2030 would look like um, if the ANC's large electoral majority actually granted its biggest policy brains the kind of hegemony that they need to pursue a clear course over the next two decades. Um, and that's very much, the work of the NPC is very much the underpinning um, of that document. Um, strangely enough, because that work has had so little political traction, really, um, in, in the party and in government um, in the six months or so since its main uh, report was re released. So while I was reading this quite sober analysis of the challenges, um, Bladen Zamandi was on the TV that sort of balances on top of my filing cabinet with his finger aloft like this, um, announcing... Uh, the beginning of the second transition in very different terms and saying the white liberal and reactionary forces are now going to have to take a step back. Um, and he was followed by Nwaka Ramatlodi who said perhaps in even stronger terms, the time for turning the other cheek is over. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I guess it was a bit of a Potemkin march. Um, if you can have a Potemkin march, it was organized for, for media coverage and to send a message to Mangaung waverers and to get people mobilized uh, behind President Jacob Zuma, clearly on the basis of the fact that, that, that the painting that it was mobilized against genuinely made a lot of people upset for real reasons that have to do with um, a history of humiliation and, and exposure, but, but nevertheless um, a very effective performance um, of what one version of the second transition might look like, and I think a very different version than the one we see articulated by the NPC. And in fact, it, that tension emerges and runs throughout um, all, of the, all of the discussion documents. So up there on the truck yesterday, we saw Ramaclaudi and Blade announcing the second transition. And with them, we saw kind of the core of the Zuma machine, um, all of the people around the president um, from Buti Manamela through to, through to Jackson Mtembu and ultimately Guerra Mantash himself, who was kind of in avuncular uncle mode um, and announced like George Bush on his aircraft carrier, well, mission accomplished. Um, we've got them to do everything that we want. Um, so once upon a time, the ANC marched, marched against oppression, and, and now it's marching against art galleries. Um, at least one bit of the ANC is marching against art galleries. So, but I think this disjunction tells us some important stuff. Um, as I said, is that there are at least um, two second transitions under discussion. Discussion an Nzumandi Ramaklodi second transition and a National Planning Commission transition. There may even be a third and a fourth variant, although I think these are really supplements to the Nzimandi Ramatlaudi strain, and those are the building of a national security state um, and the rise of authoritarian traditionalism 
as an important strain within uh, the ANC's discussion documents and indeed with legislative developments that are happening uh, right now. So, as I said, I think these tendencies oscillate back and forth uh, in the discussion documents, depending largely on who um, was harnessed by the energy that uh, Tawana mentioned um, to, produce, uh, to produce discussion papers. And you can see very clear individual voices emerging, if you read clearly, um, between, between these documents. But the big strategy and tactics document starts out by saying something interesting and a little bit strange. We want to make the 53rd conference at Mangaung a watershed conference. Why do we want to make it a watershed conference? So what it says is, it will be required like all national conferences to review progress with regards to our strategic objectives, to review our policies, assess the state of our organization and elect the national leadership. During its 100 year existence, the ANC has held 52 such national conferences. Each addressed those issues, but a few among them stand out as watershed conferences because of the nature of the decisions taken, their signaling of major strategic and organizational shifts, and the process taking the struggle to the higher levels. The founding conference of 1912, the 1949 conference that adopted the program of action, and the 1969 Morohoro Consultative Conference come to mind. And then the ANC encounters a strange sort of temporal problem that's probably worthy of analysis in its own right and perhaps more in a wiser setting than a journalistic setting, which is that it says, of course, uh, what makes for a watershed conference is usually determined in hindsight by future generations looking back at particular events and how they impacted on subsequent developments in the country. Um, this discussion document will argue that we must aspire to make the 53rd conference a watershed conference for three reasons. Firstly, it's the centenary of the ANC. So we need to mark that centenary by doing something important. Uh, secondly, obviously more importantly, we're at risk of failing in our objectives. The whole project is under threat. So, you know, the party recognizes those concerns that um, Moletsi and Becky indicated. And thirdly, the party itself is in a mess. It's torn apart by factionalism and um, battles over resources and struggling uh, to articulate a clear path and a clear purpose. So I think, I think people with your sorts of skills could spend quite a bit of time thinking about the strange temporal logic of, of planning for something that will only be recognized um, as historic in the future and about a kind of political thinking that works in epochal terms. Um, it's probably something that partly arises out of the kind of historiography that the ANC is comfortable with and, um, and a particular kind of approach to um, <coughs> the way history works, but I'll, I'll stick with the more banal journalistic questions about these two substantive reasons announced by the party for needing to pull off such an important event. That is the mess in the party and the risk of failure for the project. So the easiest way for me to do that, because I am, as Tawana suggested, obsessed with the uh, uh, personality processes, although I think you'd find if you read their Mail and Guardian as early as October last year, you would have seen the discussion documents discussed in detail before they were released. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, how does Nwaka Ramatlodi characterize the first transition? Because that will help us to understand what the Ramatlodi and Zumandi second transition might look like. He wrote last year at the height of debate around the Judicial Service Commission um, and its effectiveness the following. Speaking about uh, the constitutional process and uh, the negotiations and essentially the foundation of the deal that gives us our, our current democratic order. He says, an orderly retreat for the regime, that is the apartheid regime, meant giving up elements of political power to the black majority while immigrating substantial power away from the legislature and the executive, investing it in the judiciary, chapter nine institutions and civil society movements. Perhaps reflecting the balance of forces at the time, the movement was willing to make this fundamental and substantive concession. However, the concessions described cannot be explained only as a reflection or result of the balance of forces at the time. One ventures to suggest, he goes on, that the negative experience of the apartheid government by the oppressed might explain the ease with which the liberation movement embraced what one calls the emptying of the state. So in other words, we were pushed into the basic structure of the constitution um, both by the need to do a deal with the Nats and because we were scarred by being on the wrong end of power. So we were in retreat and we gave away much too much. Um, 
So he goes on to say, Apartheid forces sought to and succeeded in retaining white domination under a black government. This they achieved by emptying the legislature and executive of real political power. Um, on the other hand, the liberation movement was overwhelmed by a desire to create a society bereft of any form of discrimination and as a result made fatal concessions. Thus we have a constitution that represents the great compromise, tilted heavily in favor of forces against change. The black majority enjoys empty political power while forces against change reign supreme in the economy, the judiciary, public opinion and civil society. Now, it's worth saying again that he's talking about the Judicial Service Commission, which many people feel is very firmly in the grip um, of, of his own political party and actually incapable of doing a robust assessment of, of candidates that come before us, but ne nevertheless. So his, his second transition sets out to remedy these serious defects in the constitutional deal. And it involves fundamental constitutional change to reset the basic design of democracy and show that people who have an electoral majority have more or less unfettered power to pursue their project. And he's echoed with very minor variations by Anzamundi and by, by Jeremy Cronin, whose main job at the moment uh, seems to be providing intellectual respectability to uh, the project of reining in what he calls the anti-majoritarian forces, which span the civil society left, uh, the press, elements of the unions, and of course, uh, conservative or right-wing liberals, as he calls it, like the Democratic Alliance, um, Institute for Accountability and those sorts of people. So in the Cronin version of the argument, which is a bit more sophisticated, as I say, the, the, or subtle, the, the national project is too complex, it's too fraught and important to be hampered by things like opposition parties and a robust press. Um, he's willing to allow for some constitutional checks and balances, but only to the extent that they don't slow down the long march. Um, and it's a long march to the perfect peace of what the ANC calls the National Democratic Society, which is a sort of after-history state in which um, as they put it in the second transition document, you know, the best of all human societies in history are combined in a uniquely um, South African way. And to the extent that that's questioned, he says, well, who elected the Mail and Guardian, quote unquote. Uh, um, he might also say, you know, who elected the treatment action campaign um, and others who are sand in the gears um, of, 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 that, of that long progress. So where does all of this come from? You can take a very narrow view of it, which I think is partially true. Um, and that is that it's got to do with securing the future of President Zuma. Certainly the project to take control of the surveillance capacity of the state, which is causing huge unhappiness within the National Executive Committee, within the cabinet and across the ANC, um, and which you see manifested in the fuss around Richardom Dluli um, and the battle around Becky Taylor's continued role in government. Certainly, to some extent, that's got to do with President Zuma's own ability to main, maintain control of the party and of the state. And similarly, the assault on the judiciary, where some of the most frustrating and problematic um, positions from the po point of view of his supporters have been those judgments which have kept the court cases against him on track, starting with the constitutional court judgments in 2007 and 8, um, and more recently with the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment that made it possible to review uh, the dropping of charges against him. Um, but, there's a, but there's a broader issue, and this strategy around both the intelligence services and the judiciary has appealed to people who don't particularly personally support President Zuma, I think, because they are really worried about those two problems, um, the problem of internal dissent and um, internal legitimacy crisis and, and of the failure, potential failure of the project. So. So there is sort of a spectre haunting the ANC, and it's not, it's not the spectre of communism, obviously, although, as I said in a column recently, I'll plagiarize myself, there sometimes does seem to be a bit of a socialist international zombie stumbling around in these documents, knocking things over. But, but the ghost at the banquet actually um, is the ANC itself, or a version of the ANC that nags at those who are enjoying cake and champagne on behalf of the masses, as Khalima Mutlante put it, and recognize that the threat to their legitimacy is real and growing. And this is a new and frightening thing. So we had the very well attended marches while I'm talking about marches that Kasatu organized over e-tolling and labor brokers. And you know, those reflect a set of fissures in the alliance which aren't just the fissures about who's fighting for the top job. Um, they also represent a set of fissures between the alliance and the electorate. Um, they, they were only about e-tolls and labor broking in the most trivial of senses. They were really about, Zulan Zimavavi called those marches class war. 
And he spoke about, quote, unquote, the social distance between the leadership and those that they lead. Um, so this is clearly not just about factionalism, although it's very mixed up with factionalism, and it's sometimes hard to disentangle the strands of the Mangaung battle and these more fundamental concerns. So, so the march, like the smaller and, and, and often more violent protests that we've seen around the country, around service delivery, as we, as we casually call it, um, crystallized, I think, a, a sense of alienation from Latuli House that now extends well beyond the white middle class and the traditional opposition. Um, and what they show is that the store of liberation credit that's been so crucial to the stability of, of a government that's pursued some pretty unpopular policies over the last 18 years is, is starting to run dangerously low. Um, and you can reflect on the things that the ANC has been able to do with its majority um, uh, over the past 18 years that are pretty extraordinary, frankly. I mean, there's the program of macroeconomic stabilization in the 90s gear, which so many of its supporters didn't, um, didn't back at all. And on the social side, there are things like abortion rights, the death penalty, uh, gay rights, which the ANC very successfully defended, despite the fact that they aren't particularly popular with many core voters. Um, so it used that store of liberation credit very powerfully. In fact, once I was at a, uh, uh, a party fundraiser, which somehow I got let into, I'm not, I'm not sure why, with Tabo Mbeki in 2004, ahead of the elections, and he told the mostly white business people of the Western Cape, you must vote for us because the people trust us. We're the only ones who they'll be patient with. Mm -hmm. So if you want macro stability, if you want free markets, etc., etc., vote for us because we can secure that for you. Well, I think the trouble is that that credibility store, as I say, has been drawn down and frustration has risen. And we're now at a point where the party is very worried that those two lines on the graph um, are going to cross. So right now, in the sort of post polokwane era where the rules have been broken, right? At Polokwane, the tablets were shattered. The rules about how you manage internal dissent and discipline were, were, were smashed, and they were really smashed when Tabo Mbeki was recalled um, in the latter half of 2008. And it seems to me that means the party is now struggling to use internal dissent as an engine um, and an energy source to maintain its credibility, to come up with new ideas and change circumstances. And in, instead, um, some of its leading members are looking to a response that's about control and about fear um, to manage the contradictions. Others are looking to a response that I would characterize optimistically, and this is what I call the National Planning Commission approach, that's about hope and openness um, uh, and about charting a different sort of course. So I think these kind of voices of fear and hope are a more instructive distinction within the party now than the traditional um, categories of left or right and certainly also um, of, the, of the personality categories between uh, Zuma and, and his critics. So what do the frightened do? They consistently emphasize the importance of security, both for the party and the country. They hunker down and they face off against the threat from an unruly press, from civil society, from more competitive economies, from judges, and worst of all, from the ANC's own internal critics. So they sit behind hedges and defensive positions. Uh, I think they do what Jeremy Cronin once said of ZANU-PF, which is that they no longer confidently foster progressive hegemony. Um, that was when he was complaining about the <clears throat> ZANUification of the ANC in 2002, when he was outside the inner circle, unlike now. So I think Jeff Khadebe epitomized that tendency when he spoke about the people who leaked the discussion documents as impimpies. You know, these were the hated, hated informers who shopped their comrades to the apartheid machine. And, you know, if giving a journalist a document about economic policy is the same as informing um, to the apartheid regime, well, uh, something has changed. That tendency is also captured in legislative proposals like the Protection of State Information Bill, the General Intelligence Laws Amendment Bill, which fewer people know about, which is equally disturbing in many ways, that really centralizes control of the intelligence services in the hands of the minister. It also is manifest in proposals to review the judiciary, establish a media appeals tribunal, and so on. And of course, this tendency is stunningly obvious if you're a member of the National Executive Committee and you go to one of these discussions, which I wish I could get into to report on, um, uh, and you're asked to hand over your cell phone um, and have it locked away, and where you're told that there's sophisticated jamming equipment in, in place, just in case you have something, you know, another cell phone hidden in your back and, and, and texting out. So. It, this, this approach, I think, also emerges in other ways in the documents. For example, when they talk about um, home affairs and, and the party's attitude to immigration, um, you see a big fist approach applied to a whole swathe of questions around immigration. So the department's gradually recovering uh, from a lot of mismanagement um, under Nkosazana Dlamini-Zuma. 
but it posi the discussion documents position the department as a squarely as a quote unquote security department alongside its developmental state functions. And it says, quote, as a security department, home affairs will contribute to two overriding goals, national security and public safety. Every official must be aware and responsive to the needs of the people while remaining a high level of vigilance with regard to national security. Uh, if you've ever been to a home affairs office, you can decide whether the needs of the people on national security are more important things to address in the balance of that equation. And immigration is particularly framed as a security problem. Uh, new proposals in the documents for asylum seekers, for example, include locking the riskier ones up in detention camps till it can be determined whether they're problematic or not. Now, of course, that's a department that's had a long history of spooks running it, from Billy Masetler to uh, Barry Gilder, Nossi Viwe, um, the previous minister also had an intelligence background. But of course, it's precisely under the more civilian-minded leadership of, of course, Zanid Lamini Zuma that it's gotten better. And we see the tension emerge even here, because alongside the tough talk, there's a pretty humane and sensible discussion um, around policy for economic migrants. It says, should South Africa allow irregular economic migrants from SADC to work in the country in the light of the objective realities on the ground? And what are those objective realities? There are the huge anger among many, many um, ANC voters over what they perceive as the loss of their jobs to immigrants. Should, sh should we like, allow them to continue to work here, it asks. Um, and, and essentially concludes that we should. And you can have a pretty straightforward and basic open regime um, for static migrants. Um, the tension is also evident in the communications document, which speaks on the one hand about widening access um, to everybody um, for broadband and tele telecom services, but on the other hand, spends much more time talking about cyber security than it does about the needs of business um, in communication. And the, <clears throat> risk to growth that's posed by the failure of our telecoms policy. So security and social solidarity seem to be discussions that are relatively easy for these documents to have. Economic growth, maybe not so much. And maybe that's why there's so much ambivalence around the National Planning Commission and its, and its National Development Plan. <clears throat> Because the plan, broadly speaking, calls for a more open and competitive economy. It calls for a quote-unquote capable state that strikes a better balance between investment, redistribution, and social spending. Its focus is on efficacy, accountability, and clean governance. And it jars very, very clearly with the developmental state ambitions that are a pretty fundamental part of ANC catechism right now. So I think the... Um, strategy and tactics document is probably right when it asks whether this distinction signals, quote, an ideological or conceptual disagreement that should be clarified so that we don't cause confusion with a plethora of terms by introducing conflicts that may, sorry, concepts that may well be in conflict with e existing ANC policy. And obviously the short answer is that I think, yes, a fundamental conflict does exist. And it's evident, too, in those subsidiary strands of authoritarian discourse that I mentioned earlier. And those include the rise of the spies, a justification of any kind of government behavior um, on the basis of, of, of security concerns, the characterization of critics and opposition, as, as, as the Minister of State Security said, as paid proxies of foreign spies. And on the other hand, what we're seeing with the traditional courts bill and um, some of the language around Mokhweng Mokhweng's appointment as Chief Justice, which was spun very clearly by the presidency when concerns were raised about Mokhweng's jurisprudence as the need to return to and give more space to um, what are undefined but described as African values. Um, and I think the concerns that we're seeing uh, across the country right now about what those values might mean and whether they can be instantiated in a way that's fundamentally in harmony with the Constitution and the constitutional requirements of equality, for example, for women in rural areas, um, is a very serious unanswered question. And as I said before, this all gets mixed up in factionalism. So it seems to me that if Jacob Zuma needs to buttress up his conservative flank, there's a Mangaung reason for the traditional courts bill. If he needs to know what's going on with his critics in the party, there's a Mangaung reason for what's happening with the spies. Um, but there are also, and we can't ignore those and leave them out, they're a fundamental part of the discussion. And part of the reason we find it so hard in the press to talk about the basic policy issues is that whenever we raise them, um, with our contacts in the party, the conversation swings very swiftly to the way these issues are a proxy uh, for the big fight uh, over positions um, and resources. 
And so the question for me and the question that disturbs me is whether the ANC actually has the capacity right now in the position that it finds itself in to pursue the option of hope, to pursue the option of a society in which power is contested at multiple sites, in which you have a broad democratic direction articulated actually very powerfully in the Constitution, which isn't about individual rights at all, um, or, or is about individual rights only to the extent that they're in a matrix with, with um, redressing past wrongs. Um, can you pursue an environment in which it's not anti-majoritarian to contest power, whether you contest it in the streets, in the courts, in a newspaper, in a social movement? Um, or are they so torn apart um, and so challenged by this legitimacy crisis that the course of fear um, is the only one that actually feels available um, to many of the leadership? I think that the party is currently not really capable in its current state um, of addressing either deliver, delivery failure um, or internal dissent. The fractures are too deep, uh, too many rules have been broken, and the stakes financially and politically are too high. Um, and you know, those stakes include for the president whether he ends up in jail himself, um, but they include for many, many people access to contracts and mining licenses and so forth. So if the ANC fails to deal with the delivery problem, or to deal with the problem of making its project work on the ground um, and, and deliver a better life for all, um, what happens? Well, internal dissent, of course, continues to grow. And I think then the question becomes, um, how do we think about what happens next? What does the second transition really look like? Is it a transition into a situation where, as a country, we find the political imagination to think about different ways um, of moving a, a national project forward and moving the country to a better place. Um, many, many people that I speak to are deeply disenchanted with the ANC, still can't imagine opposition in political party terms. They can only talk about civil society activism. And there does seem to me to be a failure of political imagination in that regard. Um, on the other hand, this is a society that's institutionally thick and complex, um, where there are resources available, I think, um, to begin to challenge this party that is both, uh, and in very contradictory ways, a hegemonic and completely fractured. Um, and I think that is the hopeful part of the discourse for the rest of us, is to try and seize on this moment to make sure that um, even if the kind of epochal language of transitions between one state and another is just a fiction that helps you to understand what's going on, um, that we begin to grasp at uh, the mechanisms to think progress um, in a way that isn't completely defined by uh, the ANC's imagination and that is more open uh, to the contributions of what is uh, a complex, well-resourced, well-off um, society. And I think those resources exist in our constitution, they exist in some of the existing formal and informal institutional arrangements. And that's why we have to be very vigilant that things like yesterday's march, whatever we think of the painting, um, are not used to shut down uh, avenues of contestation, um, whether they are small or large, whether they are infelicitous, as that painting probably was, um, or, or effective. Um, and that's going to be the real uh, struggle, not whether, the, not whether the ANC's party of hope or fear wins, but whether the national party or the broad South African party of hope or fear uh, wins out. Um, so I think I'll leave the serious anthropologizing <laughs> to, to our shield, but, uh, but that's how uh, I see the challenge uh, in the next few years. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to all who participated in the actual live event on May the 30th, and those of you who have watched this podcast. Please keep looking at the WISER website for further updates, both from the presenters themselves that day and members of the public who will continue to participate in this key watershed debate.